Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Um, Anna, what did you make of the end of March deadline? Um, how difficult will it be for Theresa May to come up with a coherent, settled position on our trading relationship by then? Extremely difficult. And we still don't have the guiding principles. And with great respect, that is what we need. We need to know what, what are our red lines as we go into this process. Look, the, the Great Repeal Act, as it's called, um, is a purely technical thing. It would have to happen at some stage. When we leave the EU, all those things have to be done. I don't wish to be too dismissive of it, but it is very technical and it's, it's not a big deal. But triggering Brexit as early as March really concerns me, troubles me hugely, because we won't have had the French elections, we won't have had the German elections, and I'm sorry, it is going to take a lot of time and effort to disentangle ourselves and get the right deal. And the other thing that's got to be said is this. This idea that, you, that, that we hold the cards and that the EU is going to come to us and, and say, you know, we'll, we'll give you pretty much what you want. The idea we're going to get anything like we've got now is rubbish. We're going to get something worse. Obviously we are. And we don't hold the cards. The EU does. And you're right about Nissan. And this idea, because we've been given a gossip, as you might imagine, <laughs> but, but this idea that, you know, BMW, people... I'm not saying they want to pay more for their cars for being, but that is not the issue. People are still going to buy stuff from Europe. That's not going to stop. It's not the point. It's that Nissan will not be a Nissan will pack up and, and leave. Well, why go. was that? But, but I mean, you know, why was there on this issue of the day mm -hmm. of the decade almost nothing from Jeremy Corbyn on Brexit last week? And there's been almost nothing in the last sort of 24 hours. I mean, you're going to have to ask Jeremy Corbyn that. I've no idea why, but um, certainly, I, I mean, I went in and had a meeting with him last week at the conference and I said, you know, I actually think that the grammar school thing is a whole load of hullabaloo to cause us all to be distracted. And that what that strategy is called a dead cat to indeed, distract you? Dead cat, red meat for the Tories. Um, <laughs> and the... It's <laughs> horrible. <thought>. Sorry. <laughs> um, but... And that we should be focusing much more on Brexit. But, you know, I'm not the leader of the Labour Party. Jeremy Corbyn is. I don't know why he doesn't push it more. We all, all have to just make him do that. Just so, imagine if Yvette Cooper was leader of the Labour Party. Well, I'm none true. of your colleagues said that to me. Now, back to you in just a minute. But first, let's see what Allegra has for us. Well, we're trying to work out what kind of Prime Minister Theresa May will be. She turned 60 yesterday. She's been around a while, but still, it is not clear what to expect. Some commentators, eminent ones as well, aren't sure her time at the Home Office is really helping uh, her or giving her much of a, a good rep. So, look, to Montgomery, control of immigration, elected police chiefs, the child abuse inquiry, none of those three went particularly well. There is a gap between the idea of Theresa May and... The reality, pretty harsh words actually, what sort of Prime Minister has she been two and a half months in? Well, let's have a look. She is, we are told, supposed to like to take her time to make a decision, not a terrible thing, but she wants the help of a review, lots of detailed papers according to The Sun today. The new uh, nuclear plant at Hinkley is a case in point. She paused it, she reviewed it, and then she went ahead with the same decision anyway. Now, another charge that is laid at her is that she strong arms her, her cabinet ministers. She likes to, she's a bit of a control freak. She likes to um, hoard decisions to herself. She is right now chairing three cabinet committees. That is one more than David Cameron did when he was in Downing Street. Now, this particular decision was overruling Justin Greening on grammar schools. And then the third charge. It was made last week by Craig Oliver, former head of communications, that she can be a bit of a submarine. This is her disappearing. She disappeared during the referendum. She only came out pretty much once for the most important debate in a generation, I'd say. You can't do that as Prime Minister. Now, all of this criticism may be just the waspish whinging of the jealous, or it could be true. Roberts. Um, Anna, I spoke to Chris Grayling a bit about the rumblings I've heard from ministers that the Theresa May Downing Street is way more controlling of them than the Cameron Downing Street. Is that the right approach? No, I'm not so sure, actually. I think all number 10s will obviously ask for a minister's speech. I mean, you can't just have ministers no, going. So, there's, I, and I don't, so I don't think there's, 
there's much change there. I, th I, think, I think the complaint is, is that people don't feel they get the good access that they used to get. And certainly, I always had excellent access to uh, Cameron's chief of staff in particular. I mean, I just used to send him a text and Ed always got back. And that, that really was but, very good. But there's, a, there's, there's, listened to. but there's a thought that much more policy is being made from the centre and then, in a sense, pushed out. Um, and that, I think, is what's happening in Labour as well, isn't it? Uh, is it? I've not noticed. Um, but... I mean, I think the, that Anna's right. I think it's always been the way that the leadership yeah, have uh, always been a bit over-controlling. Um, I can't say that I have noticed it all that much in the Labour Party yet. Policy is made by grassroots members in the Labour Party, of course. Uh, well, that was never the case, but th apparently that is, the, uh, that is the future. Would you like to see policy handed over to your members? Good God, no. Heavens <laughs> forbid that you should ever allow these things. <laughs> and next you'll be saying that we're having party conferences that are actually debating places, when we all know that they're just media That's rallies. True. And we true. would like to say that we are as one about the conference season. Yeah. Why do we have this three-week break? It's ridiculous. Why do we have conferences that start on a Sunday and finish on a Wednesday in the real world, you'd start late on a, th a Friday and we'd all be home for tea time. It's pure entertainment. Uh, welcome back. My next guest is Roland Rudd. Uh, Roland, we've known each other for 25 years. It's in a way, it's slightly odd interviewing you. And what I remember most strongly uh, in terms of our chats during the referendum is how grumpy you were. You were sort of, you know, you were the treasurer, you were the money man, you raised all the money for the campaign, but I got the sense you didn't think things were going... Brilliantly. What do you think the Prime Minister should have done differently? Well, we were right to point out the economic cost of coming out, and that was obviously the key part of the campaign. But where we failed, really quite miserably, was to give the positive vision of what it could be for Britain to actually lead Europe rather than leave Europe. And I'm afraid you know, we didn't manage to get as many people out for us as Leave did, and, and we needed to really enthuse them. And, and what, what could the Prime Minister personally have done more on that? Well, we needed to give a vision of you know, Britain's extraordinary position in the European Union. We set up the single market, we'd actually championed enlargement, and we were now championing reform, and Europe actually is changing. And I think we needed to have a vision which wasn't just about the dry economic statistics, but actually gave and it, get, you know, it allowed people to understand what it is to be part of a reforming European Union. And, and given that we now know that the Prime Minister is absolutely livid with Boris Johnson and Michael Gove, and, you know, the friendship with Gove is over, um, he resisted all the way through the campaign, really taking them on head to head. Do you think that was a mistake? Well, it was a clearly a mistake, because there was sort of no blue on blue, which was an extraordinary mistake. It was about Conservative Party management, not about actually winning the campaign. And our biggest mistake, if you allow the dead hand of Downing Street to really dictate the campaign, then, of course, that type of decision is going to be made in the interest of a party rather than the interest of what was really needed in terms of the referendum. Uh, now, Craig Oliver, the mm. Director of Communications, now Sir Craig uh, mm. Oliver, has written rather a gripping mm. book about the campaign, uh, which I read, and mm. um, there are some absolutely amazing sort of comic moments. Uh, and mostly what I took away from it was the sort of sheer chaos. Mm. There's also a sort of pretty strong implication that it was really Craig in charge rather than the Prime Minister. Do you think that's right? Well, I think Craig basically, uh, I mean, he's a very you know, bright guy, able guy, but he, in a sense, on behalf of the Prime Minister, ended up running our campaign, and however talented he is, that was a mistake. Why was it a mistake? Well, it was a mistake because we weren't independent enough in terms of putting forward a really positive vision and to talk about immigration, and there was a sort of shutdown from 10 Downing Street about no one was to talk about immigration, and that was a huge mistake. Now, we've just heard from the Prime Minister that Article 50, the beginning of these mm. formal negotiations, will start at the end of March, but Chris Grayling refused to give any kind of guidance about what kind of trading relationship businesses will have with Europe and the rest of the world. 
What do you think? You, I mean, you represent, I mean, in your day job, uh, you run a company called Finsbury, you represent the biggest companies in Britain. How will they respond? I think they'll be disappointed because the key thing for them is they want very much to remain in the single market. They want us to remain in the customs union. They understand we need to sort of mend free movement but not end it. And it's incredibly important to them that we remain a rule maker within these organisations, not a rule taker. Because, of course, we've had a huge say in how these free trade agreements have actually been drawn up within the European Union. And, the, and any idea that somehow, you know, we, we, we retreat to a sort of hard, destructive Brexit uh, will go down very badly. They understand that the, the, the decision's been made, but they want a sensible Brexit that ensures that actually jobs and prosperity and entrepreneurs continue with our membership of both the customs union and the single market. And we've heard Nissan making a warning that it may well shift investment and jobs outside of the UK. Are we going to see more of that? I fear we will. I mean, you know, the Japanese ambassador is an extraordinary man, and uh, when this happened, all leave was cancelled, and all the civil servants throughout the summer actually drew up a 15-point you know, page plan about what needs to happen. And I this, think we, this was the Japanese officials. Indeed, up indeed, this plan. absolutely. All, all leave was cancelled, and, and and we ignore this plan at our peril because it underlines how important it is to remain in the single market, and that's what we're championing at at, at Open Britain. Now, my thanks to Roland Rudd.